Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Thomas Jänisch. I'm uh, the director of this Arbovirus Research Consortium. Some of you know, and I'm happy that you can all make it to the seminar by Mike Bush, who is joining us from uh, San Francisco. He's a professor of laboratory medicine at UCSF, but also the, also the director of the Weiterland Research Institute, which actually has a branch here in Denver in addition to its main campus in, in San Francisco. And he's also a partner of our um, proposal on uh, arboviruses that we submitted to the NIH in June. And I'm very happy that you can join us today. And uh, after the seminar, we will have a meeting of the core group of the Arbovirus Research Consortium here slash in the Center for Global Health. So it's a little bit of housekeeping. Um, depending on how many people we are, we might move over there because we have a smaller room with a conference facility there or we stay here. And there are some people that can make it after two o'clock and some people that have to leave before two o'clock. So we, we are gonna try to find an arrangement where everybody can be there for at least some time so that we can discuss the next steps for the Arbovirus Research Consortium. And with that, I and the way Mike and I met, we have a common partner in uh, southern Brazil, Esther Sabino. I was doing research with, with Esther for the last years on, on dengue. I'm uh, coordinating a large dengue and Zika consortium out of the European Commission, funded by the European Commission. And we've been there at the time when the Zika epidemic hit and uh, have since then um, capitalized on that on the network or platform of clinical research sites we have established in Latin America. And then when the uh, NIH funded ZIP study also started there, um, at some point we discovered that our way of diagnosing Zika with PCR is actually not the optimal one. And Mike's group has been working on a, on a different test that is more robust and as sensitive as the best PCRs or logics test that he might want to, he, he's going to talk about more, that we are now also going to carry out in the European funded consortia. And, and this is how we met a few years ago and then decided to collaborate. So thank you very much for coming here and I'm going to hand over to you. Hey, thank you, Thomas, and thanks for joining. Yeah, don't need it. So uh, originally the the announcement included a broader arbovirus uh, discussion, and I do have talks that because we've done a lot of studies over the last now 20 years um, to address the uh, threats of arboviruses to the blood supply. And this is a slide that's kind of a historical slide, but also still still timely and recently updated actually in a review in, in the journal Blood to look at the risk over time of the major viruses, the, the, the classic transfusion pathogens, HIV, hepatitis B and C. Um, we call them classic because uh, they were known to be transfusion pathogens uh, very early, and they, they established chronic asymptomatic infections. So uh, we have a lot of donors, uh, and depending on the region of the world, of course, uh, who are completely healthy. Uh, they're infected. They have chronic low-grade persistent infections, so they transmit at high rates. So in order to address those classic pathogens, we started with serological testing back with hepatitis B and then HIV and hepatitis C. And then we added molecular testing. So we now screen the blood supply for nucleic acids using multiplexed assays for HIV, HPV, HCV, very sensitive to close the window period in the pre-sero conversion stage. But over the course of the decades, as we drove down the risk of these classic pathogens, you can see up here how we've had to address just a nonstop stream of theoretical emerging infectious threats to the blood supply. Some of these proved to be really serious problems, like West Nile virus, for example. Um, others were, were false alarms, so uh, agents like XMRV, xenotropic murine leukemia virus. This was a, an alleged uh, transfusion pathogen that was associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, a big issue about, uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, but it proved to be all due to contamination uh, of a murine virus and, and laboratory artifact. So, but you can see here over the decades, almost every year we have to address a new emerging pathogen. And, and over the last you know, 20 years, starting with West Nile, but then dengue, then chikungunya, and most recently Zika, a number of these have been arthropod-borne arthropod viruses, mostly um, Aedes aegypti. 
So over the years, we've really refined a approach to address these agents. And again, there's whole talks I could give about responding to West Nile, responding to chikungunya, where we essentially have a similar stream of, of research activities um, that particularly take off when we're able to screen the blood supply for, for and these, of course, these arboviruses cause acute viremia. We'll talk about that. Quite transient. The plasma viremia lasts in the range of 10 or 15 days. And that's what we need to interdict from a transfusion perspective, because those are the people in the pre-antibody phase of acute viremia whose blood transmits to recipients. But once we, and most people, of course, once they've uh, Zero converted the viremia is resolved and eradicated, unlike those classic pathogens which establish chronic asymptomatic infection. With these arboviruses, they establish a transient infection. Uh, and then once you've zero converted, you've cleared the virus. And in fact, screening for antibodies is fruitless because um, the, the virus is no longer there to be infectious, but also you accrue high rates of antibody positivity. So in, in much of Latin America and Asia, you know, 90% of the population has dengue antibodies. In the U.S. and places like North Dakota, 25% of the people have West Nile virus antibodies after that virus has spread now for 20 years um, on seasonal, excuse me, seasonal outbreaks. But the key sort of observations and, and contributions that we can make to the more broad scientific questions around arboviruses occur when we start screening donors. And because we pick up these donors in the pre-symptomatic viremic phase, and we can then enroll them into prospective studies and really characterize the longitudinal dynamics of viremia and antibodies, understand the rates of, of symptomatic outcomes in previously asymptomatic, acutely infected people. So I'll talk a fair bit about that um, during the presentation. Uh, and, and so this pr prospective donor follow-up. And, and then we all also do a lot of studies looking at the infectivity, both in vitro and in animal models. So we've done a lot of transfusions of, of these units at serial escalating doses into macaques to understand the minimal infectious dose, uh, to understand the infectivity, for example, of red cells that, as I'll show you, become tagged with Zika virus and allow detection of the infection. So we've transfused macaques with, with red cells from periods of, of detectable red cell virus. So the animal model studies complement the human follow-up studies. And then through the course of these studies, as you'll see illustrated with Zika here, we can do lots of, of research to understand performance of diagnostic tests, build repositories of samples, to look at T-cell immune responses and contribute to, to pathogenesis questions in addition to uh, developing uh, enhanced diagnostics, which is a major focus of the, the collaborations with the group here. So in terms of Zika virus and blood banking, there were actually um, outbreaks of Zika that led to concern around the blood supply uh, dating back to the late 2000s, where there were very uh, large outbreaks on several Polynesian islands, the island of Yap, and then subsequently um, the French Polynesia region. In these regions, 50% plus of the populations of these islands got infected with Zika. And during those outbreaks, the majority of people were asymptomatic. These, those infection rates were determined by zero surveys, antibody testing done before and after the outbreak. Um, but at that time, there had not been any transfusion transmission cases observed. These were fairly small um, islands and very brisk transient outbreaks, one season. So, but, but studies were done of blood donors that did detect rates of viremia in the donor population at, at fairly high rates. And, and the potential for transfusion transmitted Zika was raised at that time. Of course, then in 2015, the outbreak in Brazil exploded. And it was in that outbreak that transfusion transmission cases were documented. A handful of of recipients develop Zika and they trace the samples. In Brazil, specifically, they require that they retain uh, aliquots of blood for six months a a after the transfusion so that you can go back to those frozen samples. And they did that and they found uh, that these Zika recipients, recipients who develop syndromes consistent with Zika and were determined to be infected, that the donation samples that they thought were positive for Zika RNA. So they proved transfusion transmission. This led to um, concern because the virus by then had spread to uh, particularly Puerto Rico and the other Caribbean islands, but also there were significant small, small but significant outbreaks in the continental U.S., and particularly in Florida and, and southern Texas. And there were large numbers of cases diagnosed in returning travelers from, from uh, South America. And there's, of course, large uh, migration back and forth to many cities like New York and elsewhere from Brazil and other Latin American countries. So this led FDA to 
uh, out of caution, preclude collection of blood in Puerto Rico uh, for about three months. And of course, th that's a big deal if you can't collect blood for your local community from, you know, from your local community for your local community. Uh, you have to import. So actually, the government funded importing blood from the continental U.S. to Puerto Rico for a period of about three months until we could bring up a test. And 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 we were very involved. With, there's two main companies that develop the tests for blood screening for molecular technologies. Um, one is Roche Molecular Diagnostics. The other is a company called Griffles. And so we worked with both companies, and I'll show later in the talk how the data that we generated very early convinced the FDA that these blood screening nucleic acid tests, NAT tests that we um, abbreviate them, uh, the, they're sensitive enough, much more sensitive than the CDC uh, assays and many of the other commercial Zika assays. So this convinced the FDA that if we could implement that test, testing individual donation samples in Puerto Rico and, and then eventually the entire continental U.S., that we could stop, we could continue to collect blood in Puerto Rico and we could discontinue asking people if they had traveled to Latin America. And you'd think that wouldn't be a big deal, excluding people who traveled to countries that had had Zika. But because there was a modest outbreak of Zika in Mexico, it included people who had visited Mexico within the prior month. And there's a lot of people who cross the border. So for our company, Vitalant, which collects a lot of blood in New Mexico, et cetera, we actually lost a lot of donors due to that deferral. So by screening, we could uh, interdict infected donations and uh, get, get rid of the deferrals, collect again in Puerto Rico. But most important, we could begin to enroll the donors into follow-up studies and understand the, the magnitude of the outbreak. So the FDA revised the guidelines and, and allowed for uh, implementation of testing, getting rid of the, uh, uh, the deferrals. And they also approved pathogen inactivation, which is a newer technology that some of my colleagues from the blood bank group here um, deal with a lot. Intercept is made by a company called Cirrus. So for platelets, at least, instead of testing, you could subject the products to inactivation techniques that are now approved. So the NAT assays were approved, first Roche, then Griffles, and the entire U.S. implemented universal screening uh, and, and still screens the entire blood supply for Zika. So this is the outbreak in Puerto Rico detected through the screening of blood donors. And you can see that the very first day that we started screening on uh, April the 3rd, we picked up five viremic donations. You can see we were still on the upslope of the outbreak, though. So we, we picked up at the peak about 1.8% of donations per day were positive for Zika RNA. And of course, these are donors who are going through that very transient, you know, what we eventually quantified is about a 10-day period of acute viremia that we're picking up. Uh, so this translates, as I'll show you later, this translates into a quite a substantial epidemic. And, and based on analyses that we've done, uh, overall about 20 22% of the Puerto Rican population got infected with Zika during this one outbreak. But then you can see the outbreak waned as the mosquito season waned. And over the subsequent uh, year, there was only one uh, positive in May, and there's not been a single positive since in Puerto Rico. And this is true throughout the Latin American region. The Zika virus outbreak occurred as a massive outbreak in 2015-16 and has not recurred at any significant level. So uh, we had this program we call the REDS program, which Recipient Epidemiology Donor Evaluation Study. It's a large network of U.S. It includes Brazil, uh, South America, sorry, sorry, South Africa, and China. But because Zika was uh, exploding in Brazil, we got significant extra funding from the NHLBI, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, to launch a series of studies. And I, um, I don't have time to talk about a number of these, so I'm going to be focused on this Zika Natural History Study uh, of Infected Donors Follow-Up Studies. Um, and then uh, a little bit of data on monitoring the Brazilian blood supply. As I mentioned, we've also done a lot of infectivity studies in macaques, but I, I'm not going to get into that. So this is just showing that same curve I just showed of the outbreak over time. Uh, and we had two studies that we launched uh, sort of in parallel. One of them was uh, the what we call the IND study, which when the FDA evaluated the Roche assay, they required that they confirm the infections by recalling the positive donors one week and one month after the donation to confirm that they were truly infected, that they seroconverted. This was part of the uh, investigational new drug application, the IND clinical trial that was done. So we ended up enrolling about 250 donors into that short-term follow-up study. But all the only samples we got from those donors were plasma and serum samples. We, 
we didn't get uh, diverse sample types. But we had a second study that was much more uh, comprehensive uh, that we call the, the Zika Natural History Study. And in that second study, uh, we enrolled 53 donors in Puerto Rico into prospective follow-up for a full year with samples collected at these time points. And at each time point, we administered questionnaires about symptoms. We collected not only blood and large volumes of blood, I think 100 milliliters, and it was shipped to San Francisco, PBMCs isolated, uh, frozen, cryopreserved, uh, plasma samples, but also collected urine. And from the men, we collected semen samples. So we had a very comprehensive sample set. Um, the overall objectives of, of this study, and it's a study, again, that we've done previously for these other viral infections in the donor population, was to really get into the pathogenesis question. So really characterize the, the dynamics of viral and immunologic parameters, not only antibodies, but T cell responses, and try to understand what what in the immune response is controlling that acute viremia? What, uh, what are the uh, sort of pathogenetic mechanisms underlying disease outcome? And um, we're very involved, as Thomas indicated, also in the maternal fetal. Because the other, the other big deal with Zika, we all know, is that it was being transmitted to fetuses in utero. And these kids were born with severe neurologic damage, including microcephaly. So that severe clinical outcome uh, didn't become evident until the Brazil outbreak. And that really was what precipitated the FDA to be very aggressive to make sure that, you know, no babies who were transfused in the United States would, would develop Zika. So um, one of the things we'd learned previously from our studies of West Nile and, and dengue was that the viruses in the blood are not strictly in the plasma, that they're actually concentrated in the red cells. So we were very interested in, in whether that was true with Zika as well. And so we, we did these compartmentalization studies. Um, the immune mechanisms underlying viral clearance, we've done extensive collaborations with cellular immunology colleagues to really look at the cellular immune responses and the neutralizing antibody responses that mediate clearance. Also addressing, so many of these donors, as you'll see, had previously been infected with dengue. So they had dengue antibodies that when they got Zika infection, uh, the Zika uh, infection induced reactivity, reactivation or animistic responses. And there was concern about whether the, the pre-existing dengue infection could, would contribute to a worse outcome with Zika. This is a phenomenon called immune enhancement, which is well known with dengue. When you get a, a first dengue infection, it's generally asymptomatic, whereas when you get a second or third infection, depending on the timing, you're much more likely to develop the more severe hemorrhagic fever uh, syndromes. So we were interested in understanding if that was going on with, with Zika as well, looking at clinical outcomes, rates of infection uh, syndromes, and then uh, also, again, this major contribution, which we, uh, which we believe is what we really want to continue to do going forward, which is when we do these large studies of donors, we can capture and freeze down samples um, and create a shareable repository. And we have shared samples with very large numbers of government and academic and commercial laboratories to advance test development. So this just shows, so for each of these Donors at each visit, we would collect 70 mils of blood. Uh, we would collect urine, saliva, semen, uh, various uh, bl dry blood sp spots, nasal and buccal swabs. All of these were shipped overnight from either Puerto Rico or the continental U.S. sites once these donors were enrolled to San Francisco. And all of the processing and the repository work was done by the core led by Mara Stone in our group. Um, this is just looking at the symptom uh, frequency over time. So these were all asymptomatic people at the time they donated and afebrile. You have to be. You can't give blood unless you're indicating you have no symptoms and you're afebrile. So what you can see here, though, is that the donors um, who at index donations were asymptomatic, a fair number of them developed multiple. So this is a, a sort of a heat map. So all five uh, symptoms were present and or four or three. Then these included you know, fever, rash, joint pain, bone pain, body pain. Uh, uh, eye uh, uh, syndrome symptoms. So a lot of these donors develop transient symptoms following their asymptomatic donation at the first or second visit that then resolved over time in the large majority. So overall, in terms of symptom development, we documented that about 50% of the donors, particularly those who were picked up in the pre-antibody phase of infection, developed symptoms. Um, if, they, if the donors donated later, uh, and were only detected with low-level viremia and, and 
and already seropositive, they, they were lo less likely to develop incident symptoms downstream because they'd already gone through that phase uh, that's associated with uh, symptomatic disease. So what we saw though early on when we just looked at the index donations was the, uh, we were very interested in this compartmentalization issue. Were red cells, uh, ha did red cells have HIV, Zika virus associated with them, which is what we previously documented with West Nile and dengue. So it turns out if you look at the donations that were detected prior to seroconversion to IgM for Zika virus, the plasma viral loads were significantly higher than the red cell viral loads. And um, this red cell signal could be due to just low levels of plasma viremia that are in the red cell samples. Because if there's about, in a red cell unit, there's about 20 milliliters of plasma in the about 100 mils of fluid that's in the, in the unit. But in contrast, if the donors were picked up after they had seroconverted to IgM, in that stage, we saw significantly higher levels of, of Zika virus associated with the red cells than, than in the plasma. So a lot of these donors, although they were picked up, they were non-quantifiable viral loads um, in the plasma, but they had substantial levels of Zika virus RNA in the, in the red cell units. And we were able to get all these red cell units, which are like 200 milliliters in the plasma components, and those became a valuable resource to, to study um, in many of the collaborations. So this suggested early on that our hypothesis that red cells did have persistent Zika might, might bear out. So then when we followed these donors uh, over time, and this, this data is actually now in press in Lancet Infectious Diseases, um, should come out shortly. As expected, following the donation, the plasma viral loads dropped quickly to undetectable levels, uh, but the red cell and the whole blood samples had significant levels of Zika virus RNA that persisted for about, typically about 100 days, which is the lifespan of red cells. So the working hypothesis here, and it's being corroborated by both our group and the Paul Ehrlich Institute group, is that what happens is during acute infection, the erythroid progenitors get infected with Zika. And the red cells that are produced during acute infection, a small fraction of those red cells have Zika virus RNA associated with them, and that those cells survive in the bloodstream. So you can extend the detection of Zika by testing whole blood or red cells compared to plasma. But not 100% of people have, um, have this red cell associated virus. So you can see these red dots down here represent individuals who never develop the persistent red cell associated Zika. We still don't understand what's different between healthy people who do or don't develop the red cell bound uh, virus, but we're continuing to study that. PBMCs have erratic positivity, urine, saliva, and we've, we've actually published the, the persistence, which others have as well in the semen. So again, about 25% of people um, do not develop that red cell bound virus. So to get more precise in this analysis, uh, we worked in collaboration with Brad Biggerstaff, who's uh, one of the biostatisticians at CDC. And um, this work was done on the IND samples. So the larger number of people who had the short-term follow-up samples. And we actually picked up 90 donors in the IND follow-up study who were picked up prior to development of IgM, prior to serial conversion. So those donors, because what we did was to get uh, data from the CACs that, that demonstrated the rate of ramp up viremia. And I'll illustrate this in a moment. And so for those donors who were picked up prior to IgM, based on the doubling time of the viremia, we could back estimate the day that those donors became infected with Zika and normalize the timeline to that estimated date of infection. And then that was used to uh, then look at the longitudinal samples downstream to estimate the duration of detectable viremia and the time to zero conversion. So this just shows a, a different plot. So these are all the donations that were detected in Puerto Rico. And you can see that a high proportion of those donations were picked up in the pre-IgM zero conversion stage. So without evidence of Zika antibody. So it's these donations here that we were able to use the doubling time data from macaques, which again, I'll illustrate in a moment, to back estimate when these people became infected and then look at their downstream test results to understand the duration of viremia and the time, time to zero conversion. In contrast, these donors who had already zero converted, you can see the large majority of those donors had very low viral loads. Uh, they were detected by the nucleic acid test, but they were below the limit of quantitation of our PCR viral load assay. 
But it's these donors here that were the ones who were the most informative to, um, to estimations of the durations. So this shows a, a num data from a number of, of macaques that were infected with Zika virus uh, with low dose intra, uh, subcutaneous inoculation. And you can see that these uh, macaques go through an acute ramp up viremia and then the viral load drops um, as we see in humans. So what Brad did was to take the ramp up phase and estimate the doubling time, the time it takes the viral concentrations to double during the acute viremia. And he back estimated uh, from the analysis, he estimated that it's about 5.3 hours. It takes about 5.3 hours during the acute viremia for the concentration to double. And knowing that doubling time then allowed us to back estimate. So these are all the donations I just showed you that, that were picked up in the pre-IGM stage. And here's the viral load expressed as, as log, natural log. But now what we've done here is to transform that uh, data using the doubling time into how many days prior to the donation did the person get infected. So you can see the donors who had a very high viral load when we back estimated, they were, they were estimated to be infected about five days prior to the donation. Um, the donors that have lower viral loads were estimated to have been infected three for periods, about a day prior. So for each of these donors, and there's 90 of these donors that were picked up in these acute infection pre-seroconversion stages, we were able to estimate when they got infected, and then we could set their day zero as a common day zero, i.e. the day of NAT detectable reactivity. And then we could look at the downstream, both RNA and antibody data, and derive the estimates for the length of the viremic window period. So in the case of the NAT detectable viremia, it's 11 and a half days is the, is the estimate of the duration of NAT detectable viremia. We could also look at how long it takes to seroconvert to IgM, and that took about 7.4 days before IgM was detectable in those longitudinal follow-up samples. And this is also a second paper in press in Lancet Infectious Diseases. So by analysis of all of these data together, we could then build um, sort of a table of the durations of time uh, to positivity and then the length of time that these different uh, blood compartments were positive. So again, as I just summarized it, the time to IgM seroconversion is about 7.7 .7 days. And then through extended follow-up of the, the larger, of the smaller uh, long-term cohort, IgM persists for about 237 days, and it takes um, positivity in the red cells actually takes about two days after infection before the red cells become positive. So this is consistent with the hypothesis that there's early infection of red cell progenitors, and then they, um, they uh, become tagged with the Zika virus. And then this is very busy, but basically now we're looking at the time to clearance of RNA, and with the NAT assays that... Um, Thomas referred to the, the Griffles assay. You can see that that uh, stays positive in plasma uh, for about uh, 35 days. With, with If you do eight replicates, uh, in, increasing the input volume, uh, if, you do, if you require half of the replicates to be positive, it's about 11 days, which would be a, a singlet, essentially. But if, again, a variety of other uh, measures of duration of positivity, the most important being, again, this whole blood positivity, which lasts for in the range of three, three months following infection. So it's for that reason that both for the ZIP trial in the US and for Thomas's Zika Alliance study and for the, the new WHO recommendation is that you test travelers or people who you're concerned about pregnant women, you test whole blood for nucleic acids rather than plasma. And then these are just survival curves uh, showing that, uh, that data. So, and again, just overall summaries, duration of positivity with the different assays in the range of 11 days um, if you test singly, but if you do eight replicates by pushing up the volume from 0.5 mLs to 4 mLs of tested a sample, you can extend the duration of plasma viremia that's detectable to about 35 days. But the real value comes from testing whole blood, which can yield uh, in the range of three months of positivity. But again, that's only in 75% of the people. 25% of people, for reasons we don't understand, never develop that red cell positivity. Yeah, me. Correct. Yeah. 
good. Yeah, I'll come to that. In fact, here it here it kind of is. So we know the transfusion cases, and we, uh, you know, the, the documented transfusion cases in Brazil were all associated with index donation uh, samples that were RNA positive and antibody negative. So, and and there were no transmissions linked to red cells that were issued subsequent to that period. We've also transfused macaques with small but escalating doses and. It takes about 2,000 copies of Zika RNA in the entire inoculum to transmit to a macaque from plasma. We've also now transfused red cells from time periods that were positive for Zika RNA in the red cells after the plasma viremia had been cleared, and they did not transmit Zika virus to macaques. So, and we've also we, we've incubated Zika virus RNA positive red cells on, onto cell lines, and we've inoculated them into knockout mice. We've fed mosquitoes on this blood to try to see could that transmit to mosquitoes, and the answer was consistently no. So at this point, there's no evidence that that persistent Zika RNA that we can detect with molecular tests in the red cells presents a transfusion risk or that it could theoretically uh, allow people to be more infectious for longer periods from an entomological perspective, that mosquitoes biting on someone and sucking up blood, if, if that duration of, of infectivity in terms of transmitting on to mosquitoes is three months instead of 10 days, that would make a big difference in your calculations of the, the duration and, and epidemic dynamics. So important from that perspective as well. And again, uh, we've now screened the blood supply in Puerto Rico and in, in the Caribbean islands, the French Caribbeans, and there have been no transmissions linked to red cell transfusions that occurred after the, the plasma viremia was cleared. So we're fairly confident as is FDA that this persistent red cell RNA is not infectious. And, and again, the latest data is the lack of ability to transmit when we transfuse. I think we were able to transfuse about 50 milliliters into macaques of, of human red cells, and it did not transmit. So tentatively at this point, no, no concern over the, um, that persistence, and the hypothesis is that the virus is getting into the erythroblasts. Thomas? Is it okay to do sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Correct. So for 25% for, for of people, you would have the plasma viremia detected for that, on average, 11 days. And for the majority, 75%, in addition, you would have the RNA persistence. So that's why our recommendations to you and to many have been, if you, if you want to test, you're better off testing whole blood than red cell concentrates. Because the red cell concentrates, you could miss people. Um, who would have a plasma viremia. Okay, so the, the next thing we did, uh, again, this is also impressed, uh, was to use the rate at which we picked up donors in that acute viremic window period and the knowledge of the length of that viremic window period to estimate the magnitude of the outbreak in Puerto Rico. And this is a, an approach that, again, we've used many times previously with, with West Nile and dengue and chikungunya. Um, if you know the length of period that, that you, we pick people up donating blood in that, uh, in that detectable phase, uh, and then you know the rate at which people are picked up, you can actually calculate the incidence in the population. And so this was done, again, in collaboration with Brad Bigger's staff, and I'm not going to go through all these steps, but uh, it allowed us to... Uh, to estimate the proportion and the absolute number of people in Puerto Rico who got infected. So using the NAT yield distribution over time and then calculating, by, multiplying that essentially by the fraction of time that a person is viremic, we estimated that about 785,000 people got infected during that one season in Puerto Rico. And using the population of Puerto Rico, that translated into an estimate of about 21.6% of the Puerto Rican population got infected during that one seasonal outbreak. So just illustrating how we can use the donor data and our insights on the duration of viremia to estimate the, uh, the outbreak magnitude, the epidemiology. I'm now gonna present a couple of, of studies that were just updated and presented. So all the material I've presented so far has either been published or is coming out soon. Um, this is a new analysis and um, looking at the, at the performance of diagnostic uh, serologic assay. And this is a, a problem because 
um, with Zika virus is actually uh, closely related to the dengue virus, is immunological. So when people go through uh, acute Zika infection, they boost a lot of pre-existing uh, antibody responses that are memory responses to cross-reactive uh, epitopes on the antigens. And this is the envelope, but it's also true of the, the non-structural proteins. There's a lot of cross-reactive antigen, uh, antigenic determinants between the dengue viruses and Zika virus. And, and so a lot of the early serologic tests had a lot of cross-reactivity with, with dengue. So we took advantage of the fact that we had serial samples to really carefully analyze the dynamics of, of uh, antibody responses with a variety of, of assays. And when you ask about uh, the applications, and this is the kind of discussion that we're, we've had recently with Thomas and, and May and then and with NID and CDC, we, we talk about context-specific applications of diagnostic tests. Because the, the goal of a, of a diagnostic test, if you've got someone in with a clinical syndrome, you, you want to pick up the acute viremia or the early IgM response. If you're monitoring a pregnant woman who may have been infected any time during that first or second trimester, you want to test that can pick up people for three or four or five months. If you're looking at people who've been vaccinated, you want to test that, that can discriminate the vaccine-induced Zika antibody from infection in vaccinated people. So there's different contexts of diagnostic tests. So what I'll show now, in, in fact, this is a summary of those, that you want tests that can accurately diagnose clinical cases or blood donors, screen blood donors. Um, and particularly that not only can diagnose those people, but can differentiate uh, the dengue from the Zika response. Again, if you want to um, monitor pregnant women or people who've traveled to Latin America where there's a Zika outbreak or wherever, you want to test that detects people who, with, that detects people who were infected recently, not people who were infected three, four, five years ago. Again, in Puerto Rico now, you know, 21% of the population has IgG antibodies to Zika because they were infected during that 2016 outbreak. We don't want to see those people. We want to, if you're worried about pregnant women, you want to test that detects recently acquired infection. Um, we also are concerned about reinfections. The dogma has been that once you've been infected with, you know, West Nile or Zika or dengue or chikungunya, that you're, you're protected in the future because you have immunity. But the reality is, more recently, studies have shown that people can get reinfected with dengue or chikungunya, and we want to be able to detect those reinfections. Because if, if there's not protective immunity from a prior natural infection, it's very unlikely that a vaccine will be able to be generated that can, that can establish a sustained, sterilizing, protective immunity. So this is a, a big question. So differentiating... Uh, again, vaccine-induced reactivity from actual infections, detecting super-infections or reinfections. And then there's another tool that we use a lot, and I'll illustrate this, which is seroservey. So in order to quantify the magnitude of these outbreaks that are occurring, we can collect either from donors or from, from population samples, uh, samples of plasma from before and after the outbreak seasons, and we can quantify the incidence that's occurred between associated with a particular outbreak. So, and I'll illustrate that in a moment. And again, I mentioned this about the vaccine uh, breakthrough infection detection. So what we've done in our institute is to distribute samples to all of these different groups uh, doing a variety of, of studies. Um, but many of them were, were groups that were trying to develop serologic assays that were Zika-specific serologic assays. So specifically, um, we sent, uh, we sent pre-qualification panels that included early longitudinal samples from either this Zika natural history study or from our earlier studies of Dengue or West Nile, where we had similar samples collected from acutely infected pre-seroconversion and then through the course of seroconversion. Um, and we also had samples that were from remote Dengue infected individuals. So the initial panel, um, I think was about 40 samples and uh, we sent that to 16 different laboratories that were developing Zika assays. And then those tests that looked good, we took them on to an evaluation panel. This is sort of something we routinely do. We take, uh, for many different studies, we, we pre-qualify assays that are, that are supposed to be able to detect the HIV reservoir or any other parameter. And then we, we subject those, those best assays to a blinded evaluation panel. And this evaluation panel was 100 blinded samples 
that were um, trying to identify the better assays. And again, these represented larger numbers of longitudinal samples from, from uh, acutely infected either dengue or Zika positive people uh, or, or remote infection. And then we subjected the entire cohort, all of those serial samples that we'd collected to really characterize in great detail the, uh, the performance of these best, best assays. And then, um, and then we applied those assays to other studies. So, for example, I'll illustrate the use of the better assays for quantifying the outbreak uh, magnitude in that Puerto Rico using a serial survey. So, in this evaluation panel, again, this is just more details of the content. It included 10 of the uh, participants in a longitudinal study um, with three to six serial time points. It included uh, both people who had and did not have IgG to dengue when they got infected with Zika, which is a critical differentiator of assay performance, as you'll see. Um, and then it included uh, serial time points from uh, earlier dengue virus nat yield donors, because we conducted a study about five years earlier, very similar design, where we had longitudinal samples from donors going through acute dengue viremia, and then convalescent samples from, uh, from people who'd seen dengue but, but long before. And so there were three assays that we ended up um, qualifying as really uh, performing well, and they had different technologies. The, um, this biotechnic assay pre-incubates the sample uh, with a, uh, a, a proprietary uh, uh, well that has all the dengue antigens. We, so what you're essentially doing is you're depleting the sample of dengue cross-reactive antibodies by pre-incubating it. And then you take that, that pre-incubated sample, dengue, dengue removed, and, you, and you, you, you test that for dengue-specific reactivity. Uh, there's another company called Nervitis. Uh, it's, a, it's a Stanford spinoff. It has a, um, an assay called P-Gold. It's a plasmodium gold substrate, but it's a multiplexed array where they have um, not only dengue, but uh, not only Zika and dengue, but other arboviruses. And they can detect IgM and IgG simultaneously um, using this technology, and they published this in Nature Medicine. So we've been working closely with them both in this study, but also in looking forward at the newer collaboration. Uh, this company is very interested in building a about a 10 different arbovirus antibody assay. And then the third assay was developed by Eva Harris's group. It's called the Blocking of Binding Antibody. And this is a, essentially within the same uh, tube you have dengue and, and uh, Zika uh, unlabeled dengue, and you block or neutralize the binding of the, the, the dengue antibodies. So these three different approaches actually complement each other in terms of gaining insights into what's going on during seroconversion. So, and all three assays perform fairly well. So this is that evaluation panel I just showed you. And um, what it shows is actually the biotechni assay is very specific. It didn't have any false positivity, even with people going through secondary dengue infection or remote dengue, but was a little less sensitive. Uh, whereas the Nermitis and the Bob assay were more sensitive, but they had some false positivity. So the biotechni assay, by blocking all that, that dengue antibody, you actually delayed detection of seroconversion, and we'll see that in the longitudinal data, because the earliest immune response that occurs when you go through acute Zika is the memory response that was already established from your prior dengue infection. So the earliest, most robust antibodies that may actually contribute to neutralization are in fact dengue cross-reactive antibodies. So by neutralizing or blocking the detection of those dengue anamnistic antibodies, you actually delay, delay detection of seroconversion. So, so this is the um, now longitudinal data on these antibody tests. And uh, you can see they all show uh, brisk seroconversion. So these are individuals who are going through acute Zika infection. Uh, the people who had prior dengue uh, have the more robust antibody responses, for example, on this Nermitis assay, as well as on the blocking uh, Bob assay. So these uh, lighter colored uh, bands here are people who were dengue IgG negative at the time they were picked up as infected. Um, the biotechni assay doesn't differentiate. The, there's no difference in the timing or the pattern of reactivity, whether you've seen dengue or not. And that's in part because you're blocking all the dengue binding. Um, and then this is just the nermitis assay because in, the, in the, the, the biotechni, they have a separate dengue detection. You can see that all these donors were dengue reactive at baseline because they're from a majority because they're Puerto Rican people who are exposed. And they do show some 
bumping of the dengue reactivity consequent to reinfection with Zika. So these virus reactivities go both directions. And then this is just the neutralizing responses to Zika um, that show waning. So the other thing I wanted to point out here is that although there's brisk seroconversion, if you follow people out for a year, the antibody reactivity wanes over time. So this suggests that people may be susceptible to reinfection and also needs to be taken into account if you use these assays for sero surveys, you need to understand that the dynamics of antibody over time is a big consideration, and I'll illustrate that. And again, this is um, the, the neutralization reactivity against Zika or the four dengues over time. We're also we're, we're very focused on the time to zero conversion. So this is these same assays, but now we're looking at the samples from the larger numbers of samples from the IND trial, where we only had the index donation and and one to two follow up visits. So this allows us to better estimate the time to zero conversion by the different assays and that's being calculated now by Brad Biggerstaff. So in terms of applying just one illustration, so as I mentioned, when you have an outbreak like we had in Puerto Rico, uh, you can save individual donation samples from before and through the course of the outbreak and a year after the outbreak, and then understand the performance of antibody assays at quantifying the magnitude of that outbreak. So we did that. We had actually from an earlier chikungunya study, we had 500 samples from um, 2015, before Zika hit the island, and then through the course of the uh, outbreak, as illustrated here by the viremic blood donations, we collected samples from the very first week we started screening in April 2016, and then at, at three subsequent time points um, as the epidemic peaked and then waned, and then we went back a year later to ask the question, what if we hadn't tested the samples right after the outbreak? Would we have accurately estimated the incidents that occurred? And what we observed, and this is uh, specifically the biotechnology assay with these time points, is that actually the, from March 2015, this was before Zika hit Puerto Rico, essentially everything was negative. But by April, when we started screening the blood supply, that very first week, already 4.2% of the donors were seropositive for Zika IgG. So that sort of told us the FDA was right when they said we had to stop collecting blood um, in January uh, of 2016 until we could get a NAP test. By the time we started screening, which was remarkably fast, it was only three months for that company to develop this test and the blood banks to, to scale up capacity to test. By that point, already 4% of the donor population had zero converted. And as we look over time, as the epidemic peaked, you can see we got in the range of 22%. That number should be familiar because that's exactly what we estimated earlier from the NAT yield data and the duration of viremia, where we predicted the proportion of infections. When we did the zero survey, we got the exact same rate of 22% of the donor pool had zero converted um, right after the outbreak. But if we came back a year later and we ran the same test, we, un we would have underestimated. You can see how the reactivity, this, these are cross-sectional zero surveys, but you can see how the distribution of reactivity dropped dramatically from the, the immediate post-epidemic peak to a year later. And the overall percentage of the population that was seropositive had dropped to 16%. So this is just telling us that the, um, the, the, uh, that the timing of the zero survey is critical to accurately estimate the incidence. So again, this was the same estimate that we, so it's critical perform, to perform these zero surveys um, on time samples that, that flank the outbreak in order to accurately estimate the incidence. Okay, I'm going to skip that and just to take you through one other presentation that was just finalized and presented last week. And this has to do with the sensitivity of the nucleic acid test. So what I've just talked about is how we use those samples that we collected to really understand performance of serologic assays. Now in terms of, of the molecular assays, again, we, we started screening and we demonstrated that the uh, NAT assays from the blood uh, screening test companies, Roche and Griffles, were very sensitive. But we had lots of excellent samples and, 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 uh, and we were able to look at many other assays. So this is a, a paper that we published you know, about two years ago, early on, that actually was critical to the FDA decision to allow blood screening uh, and, and stop deferral, I alluded to earlier. And this showed that the donor screening NAT assays were much more sensitive than the CDC and many other assays that were being developed. 
But this was a, a fairly modest panel, I think maybe 100 samples. So we built a larger panel. This was done in collaboration with um, the Singapore uh, government, which was looking at implementing Zika testing. They were having outbreaks. So they wanted to, uh, to assess whether the Griffles or the Roche assays were better. And they screened 10,000 random donors, and they did end up picking up a fair number of Zika-positive donors. But they wanted to uh, do a study in collaboration with us, which was uh, more powered to estimate the limits of detection of the NAP assays. So we, we built a blinded panel, and I'll show that in a minute. And in addition to running it with Singapore, we actually distributed that panel to a large number of other, uh, other test manufacturers. And were able to compare the sensitivity of a variety of other tests. So it was a total of a 300 member panel um, with 11 serial dilutions with 25 blinded replicates, each sample coded separately at each dilution, and then the negative uh, diluent. So that coded panel again was sent to these different laboratories and then analyzed for percent reactivity at different dilutions and then probe analysis to estimate the limits of detection. And this, this panel was, was developed with the, um, the international standard. It's, it's a cultured virus derived from the, Singapore, uh, sorry, from the, uh, the original uh, Polynesia outbreak of, of Zika. And so this is just showing the quantification of that, uh, those serial dilutions ranging from about 1,000 copies down to 10 to the minus 2 copies, so really to very low-level uh, concentrations either in copies or in international units. And these are the different assays. And... Um, uh, uh, the donor screening NAT assays versus the CDC trioplex assays, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Abbott uh, real-time, uh, 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 Altoona real Star. So these are major player companies in their assays. What, what's important here is not all of the different uh, content here in terms of the design of the assays, but what ends up being quite important is, is actually the amount of the starting plasma that actually gets into the amplification and detection. Because some of these tests may start with a milliliter of blood, 1,000 microliters, but then they elute 100 microliters, and they only take 10 microliters of that. So the actual starting volume of plasma that's actually amplified is only one-tenth of what you put into the original extraction. So you really need to uh, generate and understand the derived plasma input, the actual amount of sample that actually gets into the amplification to really understand why there's such difference in performance in these tests. So what you can see here is these, all these different assays and the percent reactivity. So at the high viral loads, they're all 100%. All of the 25 replicates were reactive. As you get to the negatives, they were all very specific assays. So the diluent and the very low copy numbers were all zero out of 25 blinded reps reactive. But you see dramatic differences in the sensitivity of the blood screening assays that put 0.5 mLs into the actual amplification, they have sensitivities in the 50% of, 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 you know, three to one to three copies, so very sensitive. Whereas as you look at these less sensitive assays, um, they uh, that put in lower input, they have in the range of 10 copies. And, and then the least sensitive assays, the low input assays, have, have sensitivities in the, in the 50 or so, 50% LODs. And these are the assays that are, widely used out there for, for diagnosis like from Altoona and Abbott. And then this is just a probate figures to just show this same, same stuff. Uh, let's skip that. So last thing I want to mention is something that we're working on as part of this uh, center's proposal. In Brazil, we, uh, we have a program that um, Esther leads, uh, Esther Sabino from Sao Paulo, um, and Brian Custer from my institute is the, is the PI of the domestic piece. And in REDS-3, which was our prior version of this program, we had four hemocenters that were collaborating uh, in that program uh, in Sao Paulo, in Rio de Janeiro, in Belo Horizonte, and then Recife. And Recife is this city in the northeast of, of Brazil, which is where the Zika outbreak was first discovered. So within these four regions, and then more recently, we've added the Amazon hemocenter and a, ur ur a rural region in the, in the Sao Paulo state, so we have a total of six hemocenters now. But what we wanted to do was to, uh, to use these hemocenters and the collections of blood that they're routinely um, procuring to monitor for these outbreaks. And so we wanted to look for all three viruses. So everything I've talked about so far was focused on Zika. But we're, we're trying to expand these tests to be multiplexed assays that can detect 
initially these three viruses, Zika, chicken, dengue, simultaneously. And, uh, and now we're expanding it much more dramatically to add another 15 viruses to these multiplex screening assays. And what we've done is to take advantage of the fact that the blood centers in Brazil, they screen the donors for HIV, hepatitis and B and C using many pools of six. So they, they routinely, every day, the, the blood that's collected, um, the, the samples are tested individually for antibodies, but for the molecular tests, they, they combine them into pools of six and they test those mini pools. And there's mini pools, after they're tested, there's leftover volume. So what we've been doing is getting the leftover volume from these four hemocenters from their mini pools, and those are shipped to San Francisco. And then we test them with a multiplexed assay that can detect all three of these viruses. And, and again, that's been expanded now to uh, Rivera Preto, et cetera. So we started this in, in January of 2017, and this is using a test developed uh, by a company called Hologic, which now has uh, transferred the technology to Griffles, the blood screening company. Um, and it uses real-time uh, uh, technology, so with molecular beacons. So uh, the blood screening that we normally do is, is not quanti quantitative, nor can it discriminate which virus is the responsible virus for the reactivity. So, but this new technology with the real-time Panther uh, instrument has, uh, has the ability to discriminate the three viruses, simultaneously detect and discriminate the, the three viruses, chicken, gunya, zika, and dengue, using uh, differentially um, uh, labeled uh, molecular beacon probes. And they're very sensitive. I, I won't go through this, but they can detect all, all four dengue types, uh, Zika multiple types, and chikungunya down to very low copy numbers, uh, 10 copies or less. Uh, this is actually that same panel I showed earlier that we built for the Singapore study. And you can see that the multiplexed assay is identical at detecting Zika at very low concentrations to the singleplex Zika assay that we use to screen the blood supply. So very reassuring data. So then we use that to monitor the blood supply over several years. And uh, unfortunately for us, from a scientific perspective, uh, we didn't pick up much ongoing infections in most cities. In Sao Paulo, we caught the tail end of the dengue uh, and, and Zika outbreak, but uh, or chikungunya outbreak in, in Belo Horizonte. Again, tail end with a few erratic positives coming over the years. Same in Recife. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro, interestingly, we continue to see Zika infected donations over the course of the last three years. And we don't understand why there continues to be low level Zika viremia going on in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, but then this is the peak rates um, of, of these outbreaks. So the point here is that we can take advantage of existing mini pools and then probe them in near real time for these outbreaks. And, and as we expand the multiplex capacity of this testing, um, we're planning on bringing this up as part of the, the network program that Thomas is leading. Um, and, and these donations will be tested, but they'll be t tested after the units have been transfused uh, because we don't know whether we should be screening. So, and we want to determine that. So then we'll investigate whether they transmitted after the fact. And all of this testing is, is already in place. And just the, the very last piece, so the other, this, this differential sensitivity of the molecular tests um, it's very important for blood safety because we need to interdict those, those viremic donations. But what about for clinical diagnosis? And this is just one, uh, one final study I'll show, which, which we did in Brazil in collaboration with Esther's team, where they went to two cities that were having outbreaks of clinical dengue uh, in, in central Brazil. And they collected uh, 1,017 samples from people presenting with suspected dengue at the time. And we tested those samples blindly in parallel with this Griffles blood screening sensitivity assay for the, the Arboplex test versus the CDC uh, Trioplex assay. And you can see there were a fair number of samples that were positive for dengue on both assays, positive for Zika on both samples, positive for chikungunya on both, both assays. There were small numbers of dual infections, but there were a fair number of infections that were negative by the CDC Trioplex assay that were positive by the more sensitive blood screening assay. So overall, that CDC Trioplex assay, which was being promoted and distributed as the, the workhorse test to public health labs, was missing half of the dengue infections, 40% of the Zika infections, and about 20% of the chikungunya infections. These are clinical cases. 
So this just illustrates how, how the sensitivity of these tests is quite critical as you're applying them in diagnostic context. So that's the summary of uh, kind of what we've been doing. And uh, these are all the folks or many of the folks who've really worked on, on these studies, both here in the U.S. at our institute in San Francisco, our key collaborators in Brazil, and then uh, colleagues at Davis and, and uh, CDC at, at NIH. So I'll stop there and be happy to ask, answer questions or have some discussion. Yeah, good, good question. And these are you know, questions that we're all asking CDC, WHO, et cetera. How can we predict the magnitude? You know, is there enough uh, population sort of exposure that you've got a herd immunity effect, these kinds of issues. But as to why some locations have had, you know, these are islands, first of all, that do have large mosquito Aedes aegypti, uh, epi, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of seasonal uh, activity, uh, you need to trigger the outbreak by getting enough Zika infected mosquitoes and enough humans. These are all, all of these viruses we're talking about are predominantly human mosquito human. The, the one exception, West Nile is predominantly a bird virus, but most of them require that humans get infected and that the mosquitoes bite infected humans during that acute viremia in order to sustain the outbreak. So in places like Puerto Rico, you have highly, uh, you know, relatively wealthy people. That, that live in houses that are air conditioned. And uh, the I island is fairly large with dense populations in some locations, but um, more urban regions with fewer people. And, and as we've mapped the outbreak in, in Puerto Rico, both clinical case reports and this donor data, there's highly different penetrance in these different urban locations. And it's partly again, dependent on the socioeconomics of these locations. If you look at the paper, I think I'm trying to remember the group, but the one from uh, the the Salvador in in Brazil, uh, they they focused in on a very poor urban region where there's lots of standing water, lots of mosquitoes, and they showed that in that location they they had a, I think something like 80 percent of the people who lived in that focal region were were infected based on a serologic study. Um, in places like you know, Trinidad and, and Tobago, which the French have studied carefully, as you say, overall, it was a 50% rate. But when you look at the demographic breakout of seroprevalence, it's quite different by location on the island. So I think, and, and then we come to places like Brazil, which are massive continents, and, and the United States, where people have you know, much more spread out. And you have, so I, I, think the, I think the determinants of the magnitude of a single outbreak are mostly based on density of population and socioeconomics and water and mosquito density, all these variables that, that we all struggle to understand. And, and it's, very, it's very hard to predict when one of these will come back. I mean, West Nile, every year we pick up hundreds, some years we pick up thousands of iremic donors in the US. So that one seems to come back every year, probably because it's mostly being sustained through, through bird, mosquito, dynamics and then humans are end stage hosts. But with these dengue outbreaks and chikungunya and Zika, we just have no ability to predict whether there'll be a big outbreak uh, in the upcoming year or not based on 
based on climate issues or mosquito density. So that's the goal of this new program is to is to try to understand and, and predict, and then what and then monitor and respond to new outbreaks quickly, and, and launch natural natural history studies to understand pathogenesis. And the other unfortunate reality is that, that uh, you know a lot of money went into Zika vaccination. And a lot of people have been vaccinated now in large trials for Zika. Um, and, and we're involved in testing, monitoring those trials, but the virus didn't come back. So we actually can't demonstrate efficacy of the vaccine until a new outbreak comes along and we can compare rates of, of both uh, infection and, and symptomatic disease in vaccinated from non-vaccinated controls. So there's lots of challenges from a scientific and, and research and, and public health opportunity perspective uh, linked to not being able to predict that these, these epidemics will recur seasonally and where they will, where they will occur. Huh? Wow. Right. Yeah, basic public health. Huh? Right. Right. Yeah, and if you've been to Brazil, you know, it, it, right outside of the wealthiest regions of Rio and Sao Paulo are these what they call favelas, which are just these you know, poor people that actually live in very you know poor conditions, but in beautiful places with beautiful views. So, but it's it's really an incredible admixture. So that's why they're set up, I think, to continue to experience these these outbreaks. And I'll actually put Angela on the spot because that was Angela D'Alessandro who's here and a close colleague in a lot of studies. But he he showed me when we were in his office. This was probably a year ago. The paper that came out, I think it was in Science, that demonstrated the association uh, with Plasmodia with perturbed metabolomics and and then we've subsequently applied that angelo can you tell that story please How important that is. Yeah, I mean, the concept then with malaria is that when the malaria plasmodium infects someone, it, it, it actually 
so that you, you said it, it hijacks the metabolism of the red cells to produce what's essentially like a pheromone that both attracts plasmodia to the red cells, but it also attracts mosquitoes to the infected people. So the, the, the parasite has evolved and we think perhaps these viruses, because this same red cell binding is seen with, with, with West Nile and Zika, that, that people may actually be more attractive to a mosquito biting them when they're acutely infected. And this red cell association of these viruses, like with plasmodia, may, may actually have evolved to benefit the, the ongoing uh, su successful spread of these, these parasites and viruses. So it's really an incredible story that we're, we're hopeful of confirming with, with your team. No, I, I, our experience, and we've done everything I've shown here essentially mirrors what we've done with West Nile and dengue, uh, where we've similarly enrolled viremic donors and back estimated date of infection and then durations of viremia and time to seroconversion. They're all quite similar. They all, they, I think it's partly related to the nature of the antibody assay. So, uh, if, and whether the people had previously been infected and had memory responses to a cross-reactive virus. So because with dengue, for example, in most locations around the world where dengue is, has recurrent outbreaks, the dengue one, two, three, or four, 90% of the people in that region have seen dengue before and have memory. So they will have a, a early memory response and your assay may be designed to detect that early animistic memory response kicking in. Um, or it may be designed to try to avoid detection of the remote dengue and detect a new IgM response. So I, I think it's more assay related than natural history. I, I don't think there's any difference in the duration of the acute viremia. Uh, there are, you know, some like chikungunya definitely has a much higher viral load viremia. But again, the antibodies, uh, to my mind, you know, the evidence is both, both binding antibodies and neutralizing antibodies come up pretty similar in timing influenced by whether there was memory, cross-reactive memory pr prior to the infection, and then also impacted by the design of the antibody assay that you're using to detect it. And, and yeah, which is why that whole con concept of context-specific uh, design of assays and, and different um, target product profiles, depending on how, how you want a test to be, be used, it may have com very different uh, product profiles, TPPs it's called, to to the performance of that test. Too durable. <laughs> exactly. The, the, the CDC ran into horrible problems in Puerto Rico in 2017, because they were monitoring all these pregnant women, you know, a year after the Zika virus outbreak had ended, and yet the women were still scoring positive for Zika virus antibody tests that were that were durable, too durable a response. So, in a sense, you want sensitivity to acute acute antibody, but you want a marker that's a transient marker that may only persist for you know three or six months, and so it's it, it's really. Uh, interesting to think about the different applications and needs for these, these diagnostics. Yeah, I mean, what, again, the, the antibodies that form when people go through acute Zika, they include neutralizing antibodies that neutralize dengue because they are they are induced. So it's it's we originally thought that by 
building you know, virus-specific neutralization assays, we could solve all the problems and, and that the serology would be straightforward. But it's not because the infections actually trigger cross-reactive antibodies to be formed. Yeah, I, I, I think that you, what you really need, if you, if you run the multiple PRNTs to Zika and the four denguis and you have longitudinal samples from the acute infection through convalescent, you can, you can pretty well determine which virus drove, drove this recent seroconversion. But that's pretty unusual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the gold standard, but yeah. Right. The, the guys at CDC that I think you made, they have a new IgM newt, which looks to be very good based on our, our collaborations. So if you, if you include a neutralization, but it, it focuses on IgM neutralization, I can't even remember how they do it but technically, but... That seems to be a, a much better uh, marker. And, and again, it's transient since it's IgM, so if there's just remote uh, dengue, you don't have that problem. But it's a challenge. It's... Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for seeing.